Well, hello, hello, hello. A very good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where in the world you're joining us from today. Welcome to Live from the Ranch. My name is Ken Ramirez, and my co-host today, like every month, is uh, Juliana DeWillems with JW Dog Training and Behavior in the Washington, D.C. area. Hi, Juliana. How are you doing today? Hey, Ken. I'm doing great. I'm, I'm feeling nice and settled. How are you doing? <laughs> a, a little frazzled. I'm sorry, everybody, if we started the broadcast a couple of minutes late. We usually are right on time. But I am right now in the middle of a dive deep course here at the ranch. And uh, my class is off at lunch right now while we do this broadcast. But uh, uh, unexpectedly, we're having a little bit of connectivity issues. And so one of our guests, or both of our guests today, we're going to be talking about shelters and a lot of things that have to do with working with shelter dogs. And uh, both of our guests happen to be live actually right here at the ranch. They're just going to be broadcasting from another area. But if we run into a problem getting them on the screen, we will bring them into the, into the barn here where I'm standing and be able to uh, uh, have them right here with me. So you've, you've, you've been out here to the ranch before you actually uh, participated in this class quite a few years back, didn't you, Juliana? Yes. Pre-pandemic. And, you know, seeing you in the barn, I don't know if our new uh, YouTube streamers have seen a live from the ranch where you, where it takes place here. We used to see it all the time during our COVID broadcasts. That's right. But when, when we were doing COVID, we actually often did sessions with the animals right here in the barn all the time. And that was when Live from the Ranch was a weekly uh, occurrence. Uh, we've now gone to monthly and we're streaming live on YouTube. I know that we've also told people you know, we're streaming live on Facebook. We're having some challenges with that. We're trying to work it out so that we can eventually stream live on Facebook. But for now, I know we're streaming live on YouTube today. One of the things I want to remind our viewers of is that as we talk about training and talk about use of, of training with shelters, um, if you have questions for our guests, don't hesitate to put them in the chat window. Juliana will be paying attention to that and will bring your questions to us. So if anything we're talking about uh, strikes your interest and you want to ask about it, make sure you put it in there. I do think there's donkeys in the background. You might hear them. It's a nice thing about being out here in the barn. But if before we bring on our first guest, I thought I would take a few minutes to tell you about the exciting month that we're having here at KPA. We have a lot of things going on, and uh, uh, there's a lot of ways that people can get involved. And one of those is to celebrate uh, Adopt a Shelter Dog Month. That's kind of why we're talking about shelters today. Uh, if you work or volunteer in a shelter, you're going to want to check out the Zoe Scholarship Opportunity, as well as great savings on valuable training and enrichment products and resources. You can go to KarenPriorAcademy.com to find out more. One of the other things we have coming up is we've started this past year some really exciting live virtual classes. And uh, you can join Michael Shikashio for a class called Staying Safe in Aggression Cases, which is live. Or you can join Melissa Millette for Catalyst, Feline Fun Tricks and Training. Both of those courses open for enrollment next week on October 12th, and the live classes begin in November. And while we're at it, talking about stuff that relate to KPA, we always remind you all that if you're interested in becoming a certified dog trainer, you can learn about our 20 plus upcoming locations worldwide, including some of the ones you see on the screen right there. If you want to find out more about any of the opportunities that we've just talked about, I encourage you to go to KarenPriorAcademy.com. Now, it's my understanding that we have finally made all of the connections work, and I believe we're going to be able to welcome our first guest here in just a second, and that is Mara Belez. Mara has actually been on live from the ranch once before. She is the executive director of the Shelter Playgroup Alliance. She's a certified professional dog trainer. Mara has been working in the shelter setting for about 15 years and was a behavior and training consultant at both Open and limited admission shelters, where she designed, developed, and implemented behavior program structures, including volunteer training, behavior evaluations, canine enrichment, and playgroups. Mara holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in psychology. She completed all the coursework for a doctorate in education, in addition to completing several animal behavior and training-related programs. 
Mahara does, and I can vouch for this, continually develop her skills and knowledge of canines by attending seminars and reading science-based canine literature. I know, that's, I think that may be where I first met Mara many, many, many years ago, because she's always at conferences and lectures and seminars and stuff like that. She has completed to date over 3,000 hours, yes, 3,000 hours of continuing education credits. Amara um, shares her home with four dogs, uh, Nala, Ivy, Pluto, and Bruce Lee. So her current favorite hobby is being, believe it or not, back in graduate school at Virginia Tech in the online master's de degree program uh, with a focus on animal applied animal behavior and welfare. She's also learning how to dive so she can swim with the fishes. Mara, welcome back to Live from the Ranch. It's so good to see you here again today. So I, get I, I love the fact, I, I, I loved what I read your bio that you put in over 3,000 hours of education, of continuing education. That's pretty remarkable. And, and, and of course, you're here right now at the ranch for a course that you've already taken before, but you brought a lot of people with you, didn't you? I sure did. We have a lot of the spa team here with us this week. Um, actually, we're entirely volunteer run, so um, supporting the learning. You know that I'm a, I'm a learning addict, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> um, so I want to pass on that, that learning and um, enable the team to both get together and have a great time. And we certainly are doing that this week, playing with the um, with all of the ranch animals, um, but also yeah, awesome. developing um, our our training and knowledge, skills, and abilities. So it's been a great yeah. week. So thanks, Ken. Yeah, it's been great. You have like 18 or 17 or 18 people with you this week joining us here at the ranch, and it's been a lot of fun. I, I really love the skill and talent and passion that the trainers that are here have. And one of the things you said, we called them the spa team. And for people who may not know what that means, it's not like a, a group of people doing massages or things like that. Tell us, SPA is the Shelter Playgroup Alliance, and you're the executive director of that organization. Can you tell everybody basically what the Shelter Playgroup Alliance does? Yeah. So in essence, we are an education provider for shelters, um, both across the country and around the world. We have um, shelters who have participated in our program from Spain and um, Australia, um, even a couple of people from Iran. Um, so we provide education for shelters to develop enrichment and training programs for their sheltered animals. So um, part of that, part of the enrichment program is where we had originally derived our name, so Shelter Playgroup Alliance, but um, since 2018, we have added a number of different concepts, so multi-species training, um, including cats and exotics, um, whatever kind of comes into shelters. We have also added a number of other different programs, so a safe handling program, um, and then also our um, canine assessment of risk program as well. So we've been you, you know, a bit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I I first became aware of the canine assessment of risk for shelters. You, I, I think you sent me an advanced copy of a uh, of a uh, a book that you were putting together with a number of people that are in the Shelter Playgroup Alliance. It's called Canine Assessed Riskment for Shelters, and you abbreviate that CARS. Can you tell us a little bit about it? It's a really fascinating book that has. I think it's a really good tool for shelter professionals. That's what you intended as, as right. Yeah, so it's intended for shelter professionals, um, and even more than that, it's really about um, providing an education and also um, a structured way of looking at animals and identifying whether at the level of risk for those animals and letting that dog um, leave the shelter. So, um, which is, it, it has absolutely no euthanasia criteria, um, but if this animal leaves the shelter, these are the potential risks so that an adopter is well informed um, on, you know, what or that a training plan is put in place. So, um, and different communities have different um, levels of risk that they're willing to accept into their community. So it flexes with, um, with those um, community-based criteria. 
And and what what in my involvement with shelters, which really was quite extensive more than 10 years ago, I, I don't remember there being a lot of uniformity in the way shelters made decisions like that. Has this tool and this book helped make that a little bit more of a uniform way of looking and assessing risk? The intention is, um, and we definitely have a number of shelters. The book has only been um, out in publication for about a year. Um, and then we also developed an education program to go along with that. So we are in our second cohort currently, but that is our vision for the future is that we're all speaking from the same page. We all are assessing risk in in similar ways so that um, when, if an animal is transferred from one shelter to another, that that is well communicated. We also really want to level up the, um, the knowledge of shelter professionals everywhere on behavior so that we're using the same descriptions um, for similar behaviors uh, so that we're, you know, essentially working from the same book. Yeah, no, that, that makes that makes perfect sense. And I think that's a, a great goal, getting people together. And I think one of the things that's so important that I'm so glad to see uh, SPA tackling is educating shelter workers on a variety of different levels. And one of the things is I know you have a program that's dedicated to self handling, I mean, safe handling practices. Can you explain and tell us a little bit more about that program? Yeah, we sure can. So um, just as we're trying to level up behavior knowledge in decision makers using the CARS program, we're also trying to level up the behavior knowledge of shelter workers at all levels. Um, with the first half of the safe handling program. So there's a number of behavior modules that are part of that online portion. And then a half day workshop on site where we put people into small groups and we practice a defensive handling. Um, and one of the things that we really um, try to impart on everybody that safe handling so oh, as a behavior consultant, maybe you need to defensively handle an animal on your own, but in an institutional setting like a shelter, um, having the entire team there and multiple handlers, if you do need to handle a dog that is potentially risky based either on history or behavior observations, that you can do that safely. So we use a lot of teamwork, a lot of individual coaching to make sure that everybody has um, a lot of rehearsal of that particular behavior of defensively handling. They have the behavior knowledge to know when to employ those skills. And then also a lot of the communication between the team members so that um, they know exactly what their place is in that moment, who is lead. And if you need to shift from primary to secondary, um, not a reinforcer, primary to secondary handler, um, then that is very clearly communicated. So the idea is that when something happens, that it is handled very safely with great communication. And then you come back and um, are able to describe what happened in standard behavioral terms um, when you're documenting that the incident. And it probably is helpful for our viewers to understand that so often in this program, we talk a lot about training practices and best training practice and how to train things. This particular um, program is not a training program. It's just really about you get this dog in. How do you handle a potentially dangerous or aggressive dog safely before you ever start doing any training, correct? Yeah, either before you start doing any training, it can... Um, but the, the intention is safety. So when we're thinking about developing a behavior modification program, we do have that as part of our core program, which is what we were originally sort of known for is, you know, talking about dog body language, talking about building enrichment, and then the concept that training is enrichment. So we're um, kind of building on that concept of training as enrichment, but also pulling some of the behavior modules into um, a little bit of a condensed form and then also the defensive handling. So it really is a, a subset of our of our what we call our core program. 
you know, one of the things I thought would be fun or good for people to see is maybe a, a good demonstration of safe handling practices. And I, I've got a, a fake dog set up back here. Um, and why don't we take a quick break? I'm going to talk about uh, something else for a few minutes while you come make your way over here to the barn, Mara. And then you can teach me some of these safe handling practices and demonstrate that for our viewers. Does that sound good? Sounds great. All right, we'll see you over here in just a few moments. Um, so while we're while we're waiting for Mara to join me here in the barn, I want to remind you that if you are an animal training professional or you're an enthusiast, you won't want to miss out on our clicker expos. You've probably heard us talking about them in past episodes. I'm always excited about clicker expo. See, the donkeys are even excited about clicker expo. You can hear them back there going, yes, clicker expo. Oh, they're fun. Um, They've participated live from the ranch at Clicker Expos in the past. But the great thing about, yes, we agree, they're great. The events are a great way to evaluate the latest techniques, build your skills, and learn from some of the most respective positive reinforcement trainers out there. If you join us for Clicker Expo, we have two types. We have Clicker Expo Live, which is our virtual conference happening January 26th and 28th. And we have Clicker Expo Portland, which is our in-person conference happening this year, April 5th, 6th, and 7th. And they're featuring two totally different programs. And if you're having trouble deciding which one you want to attend, we've got a special offer for you. Register now for Portland and you'll get access to live for 50% off. So if you want to know more, you can certainly learn more uh, by going to Clicker Expo, clickertraining.com. Go to our website. That's the best place to learn more about all of those opportunities. All right. So we are back here in the barn. Mara has joined me. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my, um, my angle so that you can see the fake dog back here. There's our fake dog. And Mara and I will, will come back here where we can, oh, you know what? I forgot leashes? to bring the leashes. Uh, do you remember where they back. are? Okay. So uh, we had so much going on here at the last minute that we were rushing to get out here. And the leashes are back where Mara was. So she's going to bring them out here. But what she's going to show me is something that I think is very important. I have worked with, uh, with difficult dogs, aggressive dogs in situations before. And one of the most important things I found is needing to teach all of the staff that were going to potentially be involved with handling the animal, how to handle the animal safely. And if you have a dog that's aggressive, if you have a dog that's reactive, if you have a dog that isn't comfortable being around people, sometimes you can't just put, put a leash on the dog. You have to have to find ways of of, of organizing yourself. And that's why this safe handling uh, education program is so important and Mara does a great job of teaching people how to do things safely um, and she is back with our special long leashes so we're going to stand back here and so that first she can give me instructions like she would give you instructions if she was teaching you about handling a potentially difficult dog so so first we're going to orient you to the leash itself so these are specially designed leashes for defensive handling for shelter work so um here we have a clip and that clip if we move that here turns into a handle when we unclip it then we can use that to clip to a fence or something to do a tie out it also we can clip it here to release the slip lead portion mm -hmm. and we'll Hold on to that concept. Okay. So, um, we do, do the shelter dog leash wrap, which is part of the some nice flexibility in staying safe. Um, again, like. Can I ask you just a, the, just a question? Because we're moving away from the computer and you don't have a, a, a microphone on, maybe you might speak a little louder just to make sure they yeah. can hear you well. Yeah, thank you. Um, so also, if we want to do a tie out, we can get a couple of um, revolutions around a tree or something to tie out. So that's part of the reason for the long leash. So um, this slip lead portion is pretty common using a slip lead in the shelter setting. So I'm going to show Ken, <laughs> I'm going to show you. Um, um, a couple of um, just really basic 
um, two person handling. So the first thing that we're going to do is um, when we're taking, let's imagine that this is a kennel, we're going to, we're going to have um, first person. So you'll identify who your primary handler is. We'll have the first person put the leash around the dog and then the second person with the leash around the dog. Now, always remember which, um, which you are so that the second person to put their leash on takes their leash off first. So second on, first off. The other piece of this is when we have the handle in play um, is making sure that we have a very nice center of gravity and that we are at our strongest point. So our leash is like this. So we have it around the thumb and that we can grab the entirety of the leash and when you kind of show me your hand, I wanna just see fingernails and not any leash. Now, because we have this nice length for a variety of purposes, we do need to do a little bit of a gather. So um, the tag point for the gather is hand down and then hands approximately shoulder width apart. That gives you a nice amount here. So if you're working with a shy or fearful dog who's kind of worried about this dangly bit, it's not too dangly. Um, it doesn't get, you know, too caught up in keys or anything. So we find about this is about the right length. So then do a second gather. And then again, when we're gathering, we have all of our um, leash in the hand. So we just see fingernails. So fingernails is our next tag point. So um, when we're moving this animal, so we want to, as a, a handling partner, we want to keep our partner safe. So we use this stiff arm. So we're moving the animal and we're keeping the leash here at our center of gravity. So if the, um, and often we're using, we're working with large, strong animals, large, strong dogs um, that could potentially pull us off. So we're paying attention to our center of gravity. When we're moving, we can move slowly. We're not trying to um, we're walking with the animal and not against them. So we're not pulling them in any sort of way. We're letting them lead a little bit. If they stop, we stop. What we're trying to do is make sure that they, if the dog starts to aggress and go toward Ken, I have that animal. So I'm keeping Ken safe. Similarly, if the dog starts to aggress toward me, then Ken is my animal. So we have um, the the animal in the center and they can't get to either one of us. So the conditions under which we would use this, this is a much nicer way of moving an animal than a catch pole. We might need to move to a catch pole if the um, if you start to get um, fatigued because the stiff arm could potentially be quite fatiguing if you're doing this for a long duration. But the key of the stiff arm is also um, fingers to the sky and arm straight out. So this lock, so locking this out, then if I try to push down, if I try to push down on Ken's and you're fully locked out, then that is, it's much harder than if you're here, it's much easier to um, pull your, um, your arm down and then you don't have as good of leverage to keep that animal away from you. So this stiff arm is a really important piece of that. Excellent. So, and the hand to belly. So the hand to belly is kind of a common like walking piece. Um, and then we move the, let's, so now we just pretend that we are, we have moved the dog to the kennel. They're in their kennel now. Um, and the next piece of this, so this was that thing I said that I come back to is Ken's going to keep that animal safe, going to reach, and then I can loosen the slip lead. So if you just want to <laughs> fall off. Okay. So that. So then you'll un oh. so can you unclip yours? Oh. Unclip the handle. Oh the handle. I clip the handle. I'm sorry. I do this. And then put it in the ring. Oh. And be careful. We're gonna hold the dog back. We're gonna hold so the dog back. Me, right? And then dogs in the kennel. So now take the slip lead off um, using just, but reaching, 
just like Oh, this. I see from a, yeah. from a distance. I got you. And then so step forward and keep on. So we're using this, the orange, the part that's attached to orange to gotcha. make this look like bigger. And then you can slip it over the head. It's a little harder with the um, stuffed dogs. A dog who's actually in a kennel kind of, they move right. their they head around. Right, right. Um, but the idea is that we can make this bigger without actually having to put our hands anywhere near that animal's neck. You know, I see that's, that's and then, so important for safety. Um, then taking that off. And then you have your slip lead back. Um, if you leave it in the kennel, we have usually snake um, <laughs> to get it back out of there. Yeah, right? snake hooks to get it back out. So well, well good. Well, I wonder. Um, I before before we let Mara go, I wanted to see Juliana if you wanted to join us for a second, just to see if there were any questions, because we have another guest that I want to bring on, but I want to make sure that we have time to answer any questions about the handling procedures. Did you have questions, or did our guests have any questions, Juliana? So that was a really awesome demo. Mara, excellent explanations, and I love your tag points. Thank you. I think a lot of the viewers are interested in seeing some of that leash handling up close to the camera so that they can see what the leash looks like and what exact motions you use. So I'll go ahead yeah. and get off. Um, so a couple of things. And um, for this particular leash, this is actually, we have gone through many iterations and I have to give a shout out to Yona, who was on our team, um, who has, um, worked through all of the iterations so that we can find some, of uh, a format that is really safe. So, um, we have this piece that is, that we make into the handle. Um, so your first piece is holding it with what we call the microphone grip. Um, I don't know who came up with it. We certainly didn't, but it's a good tag point. So we have this microphone grip. When you are gathering, so have your hands about arm, uh, shoulder width apart and sliding down the leash. And then this is the tag point of fingernails. And then gather your next and it's around your thumb and then your tag point is fingernails. Now, um, so if you're, I, you had the little video for Shikashio. Shikashio teaches a leash lock. You can absolutely do the leash lock. Um, it's less comfortable for me, but it is quite comfortable and safe for other people. So then it is through your finger, and then you have this two finger leash handling here. So that also locks it out. So the whole idea of the leash lock and the way that you're holding your hand here is so that that leash doesn't come out, that you can control the length and where the dog is from you. So is that, Juliana, was that enough or are folks good? That, I think that was great. I don't see any additional questions specifically about handling, though everyone is wondering where they could find that leash. Is that leash available for purchase? They are available for purchase. So um, Yona's uh, website is Science at Play. So you can gr go to her website, scienceatplay.com, and um, order those. And they're really great for shelter work. They're It's not unless you're using a slip lead for any other um, function, but she does have regular leashes. But for shelter work, because we're not usually using slip leads for our you know, at home dogs. Um, but for shelter work where you're working with, you know, many hundreds of animals and you can't fit harnesses for all of them, then it works really well. Um, there's also a video of how to do the leash wrap, um, which is, is essentially you turning this into like a quick harness just to um, take some away some of the pressure from the neck and it makes it a little bit of a better experience for the animal. But we only leash wrap dogs that we're not concerned about. This is for this particular hand type is for dogs where that were a little concerned that they could potentially tip over to aggression. We want to maintain safety. We like all of our pieces of our body to be the way that they are today. <laughs> Fair. And, and, and I will say that having looked at these leads and working with these leads in this demonstration, they're really well designed. They're really well built. They're, they're really nice leads. So uh, very, very good if you're going to use this kind of handling. Uh, I think it's a great lead. So any other questions for you at all, uh, Juliana? Um, the doghouse wanted to clarify, do, the, do all the loops go around the thumb? 
All of the loops do go around the thumb, yes. Well, so um, there's one of two ways that you could do it. So you could use the leash lock with two fingers. So that is um, around the thumb and then around here and locking it out. My preferred, the way that I do it for my hands, it is more comfortable for me to just put it around the thumb. Either way works well. You'll just have to find what the way that works best for you and your hands. But one of those two, the things that I do not want to see ever, ever, ever is any, any bit of this or any bit of like doing any of this. This is where you're going to get injury. So around, at least around the thumb and or finger and thumb. But having the fingernails as your as, as your self tag point of oh do I have fingernails or do I have stuff kind of jingling around that's the part that's going to keep this leash from slipping out of your hands. But if I could emphasize something because I think one of the things that your training program is about is it's not just about looping it around the thumb. There's a lot of techniques that of that require practice so that you use it safely because. Just like anything else, if a dog runs off and you don't know what you're doing, you're going to get your thumb broken. You can do that with any, any body part. And one of the nice things that Mara teaches is how, how to use it, how to hold your hand, what to do, when to move. And, and that's why so often when we're talking about the work in shelters, a big part of it is practicing with a fake dog until everybody on the team understands their role. And, I, and clearly, because we were just preparing for this demo, I put myself in danger when I was trying to take my loop off because I hadn't practiced that part with Mara yet and, and wasn't thinking about how to use the loop properly. So I think it's not just the thumb, it's also about what you do with all of the other parts and how you handle it. And that's what I think is great about, about the program that you put together. And we do spend about 20 minutes on just gathering, thumb, leash lock, holding. So just without even a stuffed animal, without a stuffed dog in play, um, just doing those mechanics so that those mechanics get really nice and fluid. It is just part of the way that you hold the leash, whether the dog, whether you're doing setting up for defensive handling, but it means that when something happens that you are already prepared, this is already a part of your repertoire. Um, and then you can add on right. all of the other pieces. So um, it's like back chain. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Julia, I, I think you'd agree this is really great information, especially for people who work in shelters. And after we come back from the break, my plan is to talk with Fernando Diaz, who also is a member of the Shelter Playgroup Alliance, but works with San Diego Humane. And we're going to talk a little bit with him about another education program designed for shelter people. So. I want to thank you, Mara, for coming back on the program again. I'm sure we'll have you back again in the future, uh, but I'll let you go get some oh. lunch now. <laughs> I'll let you go get some lunch. Take care. <laughs> All right. I love talking with Mara. And uh, what I want to do is take a moment to let you know that, uh, that if you go to our online store, we are offering free shipping right now on Karen Pryor training gear. If for anything you order of $59 or more, shipping is free. Uh, but that's not all. In honor of Adopt a, Do a Shelter Dog Month, we're celebrating the joy that rescues bring all of us, as well as the human-animal bond with our limited edition Positively Lucky shirt, free with any purchase of $75 or more. I haven't, this is my first time getting to look at that shirt. That looks great. I love that. Well, anyway, if you want one of those shirts, doesn't cost you anything. You just need to go over to our online store, look for some things and, and, and purchase $75 or more, and you can get a shirt just like that. You can learn more at shop.clickertraining.com. So having done that, I would like to introduce our next guest. This will be a, his first time on Live from the Ranch. His name is Fernando Diaz, and he is a Behavior Center Academy Manager for San Diego Humane Society. He has over 15 years of experience in the animal care industry. He has worked with marine mammals, reptiles, fish, cats, dogs. He oversees the development and administration of all aspects of the Behavior Center, the Behavior Center Academy and Shelter Outreach Program. Fernando formerly served as a board member at large for the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants, that's the IAABC. Fernando is a certified 
a dog behavior consultant, and a certified shelter behavior specialist, and a certified professional dog trainer. Fernando works with cats, dogs, and reptiles through his business, which is Building Better Bonds Pet Consulting, where he focuses on fear-based behaviors and aggression. Additionally, Fernando is a professional member of APDT. Fernando is on the board and president for the Shelter Playgroup Alliance, which, which Mara also represents. And he's part of the handling education team, the grading team, and an instructor for the CARS program. Fernando lives in California and shares his home with two hound dogs and a cat. Fernando's, I'm so glad you're here. It's been nice getting to know you during the class here mm -hmm. at uh, uh, the Dive Deep class. But Fernando, welcome to Live from the Ranch. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, I'm so glad to have you here. I'd love to hear, first, before we go into any of the things we were planning on talking about, just tell us a little bit about your background and and, and how long you've been at, at, at San Diego Humane and a little bit more about your responsibilities there. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've been at San Diego Humane for a little over a year now, uh, about maybe a year and a half. Um, and it really was an awesome opportunity. Um, the, the entire team there is dedicated towards um, not only doing behavior work and, and, and shut their industry, but really providing for other organizations throughout the nation and, and beyond even. And so, you know, we have right from the very top, our CEO, Gary Wiseman, who is uh, constantly pushing us to work with other organizations and uh, supporting us in that. Uh, we have uh, Amanda Kowalski, who is the VP of Animal Welfare. Uh, she has done countless years of work, just building the behavior department, behavior and training, um, providing resources, uh, she's responsible for my position, in fact, um, and this is her baby. And so I'm kind of crossing my fingers that I, I do well by her in this. Um, but she has been an, an integral part of the team. We have uh, multiple uh, locations that work on behavior, including our behavior center at San Diego, um, with over 30 staff members there, uh, all working to help these animals to get to the point where they're adoptable and available. Um, and out of the around a little over 29,000 animals that came in last year, 700 of those went through our behavior center at one of our locations. And so now I'm working with the Behavior Center Academy to provide resources and education, uh, provide documents, SOPs for other organizations uh, nationwide and beyond. That's 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 really great. I, I think that's terrific. And you're also involved in the uh, Shelter Playgroup Alliance. You're here with that group this week. Um, what is your role with them? And tell us a little bit more about what you do with uh, with SPA. So I'm, as you mentioned, I am president of the board of directors for Shelter Play Group Alliance. Um, I work with them going out to workshops to help with uh, some of that defensive handling that you just showed with Mara. Um, I also do some of the grading for the various educational programs that are provided by the Shelter Play Group Alliance. Um, and I'm one of the co-authors for the uh, CARS book that you mentioned earlier, the Canine Assessment of Risk for Shelters. This book right here. That's it. So one of the things that, that you and I were talking about as we were, were thinking about having you on the program, you were telling me a little bit about, uh, but first of all, I really am impressed with the number of educational programs that, that SPA supports. And one of them that you were talking about with me was the uh, BEAR program, B-E-A-R, BEAR program. And I thought maybe we could show everybody uh, a little video that you provided that's sort of an overview of the program, and then we can actually talk about it. Does that sound good? That, that sounds great. I do want to emphasize that a lot of the work I do for San Diego Humane as part of the Behavior Center Academy Manager is actually beyond BEAR. Um, I've worked with the National Animal Care and Control Association to provide education for animal control officers so they can do, do more work in a, in a more uh, Lima, from a Lima perspective, and they're not going to more aversive methods right away. We have externs coming in from the local college. We also have externs coming in as far away from Hawaii to learn from us. And we're building a repository of knowledge for other organizations. So while Bear is huge and it's the time-consuming portion of my job, um, we it, it goes well beyond that. And 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 my understanding is a big part of your job at San Diego Humane is education in all these variety of ways. And and so uh, that's that's really terrific. And it seems to me that it, it's something that's really sorely needed for shelters all over the country and all over the world, in fact. So um, let's let's watch the video about Bear, and then you can maybe tell us a little bit more about particular programs. Does that sound good? Sounds great.
So the, the, it seems like a pretty comprehensive program. It covers a lot of stuff. And so just, just to make sure we're clear, BEAR stands for uh, Behavior Enrichment and uh, Resource Pro... Uh, no, no. Is it rescue or what, what? I'll ask you. What does it stand for? <laughs> it's a mouthful. It's the Behavior and Enrichment Academy and Resources. Ah, excellent. Behavior Enrichment Academy and Resources. So tell me a little bit more about the program. Why did you design it? Who is it really for? How do people access? I mean, I have tons of questions about it. Uh, yeah, it's it's definitely, it came about uh, through many conversations. We recognize the need for uh, shelter professionals to have a career path uh, who are interested in behavior. Also, for even if you're not necessarily interested in behavior, we recognize that behavior connects with all the different parts of an organization. Uh, and because I work with the Shelter Playgroup Alliance as well, we kind of started talking about it and realized we were on the same pathway and decided to actually collaborate together. And so as I work in both worlds, we were able to work together to build this program. And it, provide, it starts off with providing uh, basic education, um, learn, how animals learn and behavior modification, um, moves on to you know a workshop that kind of takes those skills that you learned online through and through uh, peer review, and from there goes into other programs where we talk about things like um, how do you do assessments, evaluations, further workshops that again put those those skills you know to use in person. Um, how do you, how does the behavior department work within an organization, which is a huge issue. We have a lot of behavior departments that get siloed that become their own entity. And they don't necessarily work well within the organization, which is something that needs to change for the industry Absolutely. in general. Um, we have a program that talks about leadership, developing leaders, the behavior leaders. There, there are very few, you know, there are lots and lots of behavior professionals throughout the nation, but very few that are specialized within the shelter industry. It's mm -hmm. sorely needed. There are more positions available and more leadership positions in particular than there are professionals to fill them. And so this provides an opportunity to kind of develop these individuals and guide them through that process. So they, they know when a behavior intervention is needed. They know when, uh, how to create a behavior modification plan, um, able to assess what an animal needs, whether an animal is safe and, and what precautions are needed to place that animal. And so I, I think that's fascinating, but what I think is really great about the program, you, you haven't developed this program just for San Diego Cubane, it's available to, others to take as an online program so people at shelters all over the world can participate in this right how do they find out more details about the program and where can they learn more if they're interested in participating so we're still working on the, the actual website but it's going to be uh, connected to the san diego humane website mm -hmm. and we'll actually have a page there just for bear and we're going to start off with the initial program which we're expecting to take you know several months a good six to eight months to kind of complete um, the overall program is multi-phase, multi-year, so it's going to take a while to get through it. Um, and you can go through specific portions. But if you go to the San Diego Humane website, we expect to have the bear portion of it up and running at the beginning of December. So we're almost there. Uh, with the first class is actually starting in February of 2024. So it's around the corner, um, and we're going to hit the ground running. We're going to have online courses with uh, secondary feedback. So, you know, you provide an assignment or, or an assessment and someone's going to be there working hand in hand with you saying, okay, here's where you did a fantastic job. Here's where we can, where we can make improvements and, or make adjustments and guide you through that process, making you a better, a more educated uh, professional. So that's exciting. That's a, it's a brand new program that's just about to launch. And uh, how do does someone decide if or recognize if it's the right program for them? Is, is it really for people at all levels working within a shelter or would you say it's directed more toward specific jobs? Tell me more about that. So the initial portion that we're offering, I would say is more of a beginner's area. It's gonna have a lot of education on how animals learn, how to do behavior modification, uh, basics of learning theories, operant conditioning, classical conditioning, um, and so anyone who has an interest in learning about behavior would definitely, whether they're in a shelter or not, uh, could, could definitely um, gain from this, as well as people within a shelter. And I would say for nearly any department within a shelter, they would benefit from this. Um, learning how an animal works, whether you are a vet tech or a vet, or you're working in adoptions, you know, uh, the intake area, you need to be able to know how an animal works so that you can do your job more safely, effectively, and humanely. Excellent. And so from your perspective, Fernando, you've been you've been in the industry and working in the field for 15 years now. Or, and, and I guess my question is, 
how common is training in a shelter? It seems that often in shelters, your dog's coming in and they're going out. And I know that some shelters have very structured pr training programs and others don't have one at all. And I, I wonder where we are as a community in normalizing and, and, and recognizing the value of training in the shelter world. I would say that we're beginning to recognize that it is a necessary part of sheltering. It's not um, an extra or uh, something that would be nice to do. However, I, I also, from my personal experience at least, I see very few shelters have dedicated behavior departments or even when they do have well-trained, experienced behavior personnel there. There are people who unfortunately are having to learn as they go. Um, and, and there are very few uh, courses available for behavior professionals that really provide that feedback where you're having someone work with you um, and, and help you to develop and learn the processes. Um, luckily, you know, at San Diego Humane, we have the Behavior Center, and that's a huge organization, but not every organization have, has those resources or the dedicated leadership um, to, to put to funnel those resources in that direction. And so a lot of organizations, really, we've had uh, organizations come from as far as Australia come to visit us, to work with us, to learn a little bit more about how we handle certain behavior situations, how we run our processes, uh, so they can improve their own processes where they're from. Uh, so it's, it's actually relatively rare, I would say, to have really well-developed behavior programs throughout the nation. And, 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 and I, I, I knew that was going to probably be your answer, because I've certainly worked with a lot of, of programs. Um, and you say that maybe people are beginning to come around to the recognition of that. Well, what do you think needs to be done to help highlight that? I, I, I know from my own experience that often it's a, 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 a thought process often for a lot of people is, well, yeah, if you're going to if you're training a puppy or if you're training for some other important, uh, you decide you want to be involved in, in agility or something, then you need to train. But I don't think people recognize the value of behavior management and enrichment in the broader sense. And I guess, is that a message that's getting to people at the leadership level within shelters who maybe do they often come from a training and background or they often don't come from a training background and thus we have to educate them about that? How, how do we affect that change? I definitely think that it has to be something that leadership is involved with, mm -hmm. um, whether it be bottom up where you convince leadership and have those discussions or leadership just takes a natural interest in it. Um, I do think, you know, personal experience, um, a lot of senior leadership don't have that behavior experience. Um, right. and I've, I've talked to many, you know, VPs and, and CEOs and presidents and discussed the need for it. And I've gotten a couple of actually, you know, they've taken it by the reins as it were, and, and really showed an interest and wanted, to, wanted themselves to learn. Um, but it's not there yet. I think we are learning that a lot of the animals coming in and out of the shelters right now have more severe needs, placement is becoming more difficult. Um, there's a lot of politics involved with some of this, which I won't get into, of course, but there's definitely a need for um, someone to help in, or individuals to help with these animals, provide them with direction, uh, with, with uh, training, uh, oftentimes some sort of behavior modification um, so that they can safely and successfully go into the community. And, uh, and as, as someone who's been doing education yourself and really been trying to teach a lot of people, um, how how um, how have you seen the the changes start manifesting themselves? Are you are you really beginning to see a lot more people embracing uh, the idea of training and enrichment and and beginning to really look for that kind of experience in the shelter? Is is that what something you're hoping that this course can help promote? Absolutely, um, I can speak to several shelters that I've worked with where I've noted within a three to five year period, a huge shift in what they consider to be safe adoption placements. Um, right. And whether those okay. animals went to other shelters or rescues, um, they're seeing that these animals can be worked with, can safely go into the community, um, but they need more work. Um, and, and then there's also animals that we need to look at more closely. And, and you know that's why we have the risk assessments and evaluations, um, but that's an entire process. What I really love right now is that I'm starting to see that things like, you know, you mentioned enrichment, which Shelter Playgroup Alliance is, is, you know, works very heavily with, it's no longer considered an extra. I'm seeing it being considered a vital part of behavior work. Um, if you don't have enrichment, you can't go beyond that. If you don't have the basics, you know, the, the vet care, a healthy animal that's enriched and, and, and you can't move on beyond that. It's just not possible. 
and it's no longer something that's an option. Now, I, I love hearing you say that. It's clearly been something that I, I, I've been saying for a long time myself. It's such an integral part of good animal care. And I'm so glad to see you're putting these programs together to try to spread that and get that word out there even more. Uh, I wanted to see if Juliana wanted to join us. We just have about five or six minutes left. And I wanted to see whether, A, if we have any questions from our viewers, or if Juliana herself would like to jump in and ask any questions. Hey, Juliana, I think this has been an interesting discussion. I, don't you agree that this program sounds like a really something really needed in the community? Oh, absolutely. So I got my start in dog training at shelters, which I feel like a lot of us did. And I totally, this discussion kind of about the disconnect between people who understand behavior and then the people who are making decisions about how the shelter is run was often very, it was frustrating because there would be a lot of stuff happening at the shelter where it wasn't helpful to the behavior and it, it was making it harder. And gosh, this idea of the behavior team as a silo, I'm like, oh, this is all so, it's, it was, it's so relatable. So yes, absolutely. This program sounds amazing. If you were to pitch to leadership or a shelter about what this program, what benefits there are, how it could change their shelter operations as a leadership who's like behavior, behavior, you know, which is like sadly not uncommon. What are the benefits that they're going to see from putting their staff through this program and implementing it? Well, obviously this, this program offers a lot of behavior education, um, but when you really get down to it, this program allows uh, shelters, rescues, other organizations to not only provide more enrichment, um, more Lima based, more um, behavior modification for their animals, which in turn can shorten length of stay, which is often a huge concern. Um, so we're getting we're working with these animals. We're providing more. We're shortening length of stay, which looks good for everyone. Board of directors love to hear that. Um, you know, everyone's always that's one of the buzzwords. Mm -hmm. um, but it also provides um, more, a safer environment for staff. So you have fewer injuries, which, you know, that goes back to insurance, you know, you come back to that bottom dollar. <laughs> yeah. um, so we're circling around saying, okay, we're providing more enrichment. We're providing happier animals that show better. They're not as stressed. They go out the door faster. We have safer uh, environments for our staff. This is a win, win, win. I want to like scream it from the rooftops. I, I love everything you're saying. And that's where, that's what, I mean, all of us get it, obviously, but so many people don't understand that behavior touches everything in it. It impacts flow of animals. It impacts bottom line. It impacts length of stay, like everything. And so if everyone would just pay more attention and and learn about it, it I, you're totally right. Obviously, it's going to benefit everyone. We have a lot of folks in the comments who are asking about where to get more information about this program. You mentioned it's starting in 2024. Where can they stay updated about uh, when, when they can sign up? Well, they visit sandiegohumane.org. Uh, we'll be having a page coming up by the beginning of December. So there'll be, if they check around then, they should see links for it at the beginning of December. Um, and they'll be able to sign up for it at that time with again, the, the course formally starting on February 1st. Oh, and I'm just going to I think I showed the Group Alliance Spa uh, newsletter also has it. We'll have information on it as well. Great. Excellent. That's that's great news. And and I, it's it's funny when a, a group of us get together that are all on the same page. It's like, well, of course, that's the way it should be. But it isn't necessarily obvious for the people in administration or people who are outside of the training community who don't recognize that. So I think it's important for us to keep getting together and shouting it out, letting people know, informing people about it. And I really appreciate the work that you're doing with that, Fernando. I'm going to go, to go ahead and say goodbye to you right now. I look forward to that program coming out and hearing more about it for sure. And while we're saying goodbye, I also want to remind everybody that KPA actually has a uh, shelter training and enrichment course. And although we don't have a special offer on it right now, we do want to let you know that it's a valuable course for people interested in learning more about the basics of getting started with training and enriching your animals that might be in a shelter. I also want to say I'm looking forward to next month's broadcast. I will be on the road and live from the ranch will actually not be live from the ranch, but will be live from 
Africa, where I am going for my sixth year in our elephant concert conservation project. And we'll talk a little bit about the training that we're doing there. That will be November 2nd, again, 1 p.m. Pacific time. I hope that uh, many of you will join us. Juliana will be with me. And in a lot of ways, she'll sort of be talking to me and interviewing me about what's going on with the project in, in Africa. We also want to remind you that uh, if you have suggestions or ideas that you want to contribute to Live from the Ranch or videos that you want to submit or suggestions for future uh, guests, please go to our website, theranchclickertraining.com live. You'll see a suggestion comment section or a place to share training videos. Please click on that. We love hearing from you. We love providing you with information that you enjoy listening to here on Live from the Ranch. And uh, finally, I just want to say goodbye and remind you that we have some wonderful things going on here. We have many things happening here at Karen Pryor Academy. And uh, we told you about uh, uh, our classes, Michael Shikashio on safe handling, Melissa Millette on cat and, and training cats and wonderful tricks with your cat. Um, also, Clicker Expo 2024, a wonderful uh, program coming up, two separate programs, our live Clicker Expo, January 26th, 27th, and 28th, and our in-person expo in Portland, Oregon, April 5th, 6th, and 7th. And finally, an opportunity to get your free Positively Lucky t-shirt uh, with a purchase of $75 or more from our online store. We've enjoyed bringing live uh, from the ranch to you here. Uh, I appreciate my guest, Mara Velez, Fernando Diaz. We are here uh, having fun at the ranch. We're going to go back into a little learning opportunity as we're going to talk more about training in our dive deep course. This is our last course of the season here at the ranch, but if you're interested in visiting us at the ranch, we have wonderful courses. They'll, you, know, you can go to our website and learn more about those courses that'll start uh, next year. We even have a little taste of the ranch coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. If you're in the uh, Seattle area, you ought to look that up online as well. Uh, it, you can come over here for a couple hours to learn a little bit about the ranch and get a little education as well. Anyway, I'm just full of plugs today. I apologize. I hope you, you enjoyed learning about the shelter programs. We'll see everybody again next month. Happy training. Bye-bye.